Welcome to Que Sara Sara, a podcast hosted by me, Sarah Ann Lalone. Join me as I go straight to the sources of my curiosity. Each episode, I get to discover or rediscover everyday educators as we discuss their passions and their projects. Listen in on our conversation and let our words spark imagination and inspiration. You're listening to episode 90 with Amber Gross, the Nurtured Heart Approach. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Amber Gross, who is a primary special needs teacher from the Ottawa region. And if you don't know Amber, her Twitter bio says that she finds joy and learning every single day. So that resonates with me, and she's clearly someone um, who... I've actually been wanting to have on the podcast since January 10th, 2018, and we are now September 26th, 2019, and we are connected. We are ready. Amber, how is it going? I cannot believe you have that date written down. That is too funny. I had to go back in the archives. Is that the day that we met? (laughs) Not Um, even. I am doing... (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, because we met at Ed Camp Ottawa, so that must have been before when we connected on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I am doing, I'm doing great. It's been a busy week, but I'm doing great. Very cool. Um, what does a busy week for you look like? Can you give us a little bit about um, what your context is right now? What, uh, how many years you've been teaching? I don't even think I know that. Yeah. Um, I, well, I got my teaching degree in 2014. So okay. this is technically year six that I'm like the school year that I'm going into. Mm-hmm. And um, like you said, I am a primary special needs teacher in the Ottawa area. And basically what my class consists of is that I have 10 beautiful kids um, and they have a range of exceptionalities. And I get the absolute honor and privilege to be able to teach them and connect with their families and just build programming around what best would support them in their years of learning. And if I do get the privilege of getting them right at the start in grade one, I typically can have them up to three years before they head off to the next program. Wow. So are they all in the same year right now or are they different? No, I have five grade ones, four grade twos, and only one grade three. So it can vary from year to year. Hmm. Interesting. And is 10 like a perfect number? How is that going? Um, well, in the sense of if we're splitting, so it's myself and an educational assistant together as the team. So if we're splitting into smaller groups, the groups are no bigger than five. So that's kind of nice. It really gives you that more of one-to-one time with programming. Um, but, uh, I mean, if we're thinking of the tables I sit at, it only fits four kids at the table with the chairs, Uh. (laughs) (laughs) but, um, but 10 is nice. 10, uh, I mean, it maxes out at 10. I can't have more than that anyway, but it's a nice balance where I get to know my students well enough that sometimes I'm not looking at the IEPs anymore, like the physical written copies, because I know them so well. Uh And I get to really, um, really connect with the families as well. Um, with only 10 students, it means that even if I'm only calling one a day to check in or emailing or writing a note, within two weeks, I've spoken to every single family. That is lovely. That is so, so mm-hmm. good. Is that something when you um, got your teaching degree that you were already passionate about? Were you kind of aiming to go into that field or was it new? No, I wasn't. Yeah. Um, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher. All, it was a goal, high school, university, teacher's college. Um, and it was a surprise that I just kind of fell in love with this field of education. I got a job offer two years ago and it was only supposed to be two weeks and, Mm -hmm. uh, turned into a full year and it was probably, well, to this day, the biggest learning year that I've had. I still might be able to say that years from now, but it was almost like a being thrown in the deep end and get ready to swim. And I was ready. And as I continued to learn, I realized 
this is a challenge that I very much enjoy. I don't go home and I'm like, oh, I never want to do this again. I go home and I'm like, I feel exhausted, but in a really good way where I want to go back and I want to learn more so that I can do the best that I can for them. I loved your confidence there when you were like, I was ready. I was just just ready to go in and like almost ready to just dive right into the deep end, not necessarily knowing Mm -hmm. uh, like how to swim. You know what I mean? Have you always been Mm -hmm. someone eager to kind of jump in and take risk and just roll with the punches? Uh, I think it depends. Uh, With teaching, I, I knew it was something I always wanted to do. There was just a passion that was like placed inside of me that I knew this is where, where I wanted to be. Um, but I think that ignited even more when I, I met this field, um, where I originally thought there is absolutely no way that I'm qualified to be here. I started in a school when I did start in special education, where there was a lot of, um, educators in this field and they knew what they were doing. Like I could ask them a question and they'd be like, oh yeah, you can go here or you can use this resource or you can talk to this person. And I was like, how do you know all of this? How do you reach your kids like this? And instead of though intimidating me, which it did feel intimidating, Mm -hmm. but it also inspired me. And all of a sudden I was the one walking into their classrooms and going, okay, I've got this class. I teach in this field now. Teach me, let me learn from you. Let me see what you're doing. Um, But uh, yeah, I I do. I'm a very determined person. Uh, People will tell you that. So if there's an area that I really want to get into and learn about, it's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's so cool. Okay, because first off, I think no matter in what field, like you could be going into like a gym class or a grade 12 Mm -hmm. uh, biology class or a spec ed, you know, one, two, three class. I think all new teachers kind of feel like I'm not prepared or knowledgeable or competent enough to be here. Um, Mm -hmm. that's definitely normal. I, I still feel that, you know, I tell that to my kids, like, oh man, you know, teach me. Why don't you guys switch places with me? Like, I want to be a student for now on kind of thing. (laughs) You guys come up here and see what it's like. Um, so yeah, I really like, I connect with that on a very deep level. And I know that teachers new teachers definitely who are listening, um, have felt that way. But what I find so incredible is that you are able to not let that almost that like self doubt or that imposter syndrome take over your, your confidence. Like you, you rose to the challenge. And I definitely like, when I see things go on Twitter, that are about like elementary, um, like special needs classes. Like I think of you and I see you as like becoming yeah. this expert. And I think that's really cool. Oh, well, thank you. I, I absolutely love it. And I do agree with the, like being a new teacher in that imposter syndrome. I think you wrote a blog post about it once. Yeah. And I remember being like, oh yeah, yep. I know how that feels. And, um, I said it on an, another podcast I've done before where, you know, you read these educator books sometimes and you can always feel two different ways. You can feel inspired or you can read them and go, oh my goodness, what a terrible teacher I am. Mm -hmm. I need to learn all of this still. But I realized that feeling like that terrible way, if you're reading something, all it does is just make you feel bad. But if you're like, okay, yeah, but, but if I learn something, what can I apply? And I don't remember who it was, but somebody tweeted something else, uh, something out once and said, when I go to professional development, I always try to find one thing that I can literally walk into my class tomorrow and try to implement. Like, Mm -hmm. don't just let it sit. Don't let it stew because maybe you're going to forget about it. Um, So I've kind of taken that on of if I'm going to learn something, what is something I can implement as soon as possible or try out or learn more about um, in order to keep that learning going? Yeah. The best workshops I've been to have always offered me something that was so concrete or like a strategy that was just so quick and efficient and like simple to introduce, right? It didn't take like yeah. two weeks to, you know, get your students and, and model and do this and that. Like here is something, a t- it could just be like a tip, you know, on like Google that I can implement tomorrow in just like my daily routine. And one thing actually talking about Google, um, because before the podcast, I was just like going through your website, which looks amazing and beautiful and like 
you've been keeping it really up to date. And I looked through some of your blogs and I seen your sketch note. And on the sketch note, it said, ask me about Google Keep. And not that I really prepare any questions for this podcast, but one thing that I was curious about was how you use Google Keep, um, maybe in like your organize as an organization tool or as just being efficient on like note taking. What kind of um, what kind of tool is it for you? Yeah, um, how long do you have? Um, <laughs> yeah, I love everything. <laughs> I love Google Keep, and actually, um, what I'll do when this episode does come out, I actually have a document that I created about it um, that I can share out as well. Um, it is the way I organize my teaching life. Um, there are labels that you can use. It's basically like organizational pages. Um, so one of them is just for me. So I've got my to do list. I've got my to call list. So if I, uh, something comes up during the day and I'm like, oh, I need to call this parent at the end of school, I put it on a separate list. It also keeps, helps me to keep track of who I've called in the past. Mm. Um, I've got, you guys, I have the garage code to my underground parking there just in case my brain decides not to work in the morning. Yeah. Um, I've got the phone tree in case something comes up and I have to figure out who I'm supposed to call. Um, so that, that part alone keeps me so organized. And if I've got my phone out, um, most of the time my teammate, she knows that I'm adding something to that to-do list that just popped in my head because then it's down, it's noted, and then I can check on it later. Um, but then I also use it for assessment, um, being in the class that, uh, in the field that I teach in, I don't have marking to take home. I don't give a test and then take it home and mark it. I'm marking and assessing and collecting data right in the moment. And I am, I try to go as paperless as possible. One, because I don't want to have this huge binder of papers. And then when I go to write report cards, I'm flipping through all these pages and going, oh, when did they do this? Or, you know, for that, or write scribble notes all over and you get sloppy with your notes and then you can't read your own handwriting. Yeah. So in Google Keep, I have another label. And right now I'm in the pre-assessment phase because IEPs aren't due uh, for a, a little bit longer. I still have some time to write them. So I'm assessing right now what they know so that when I do do write their programming, I'm able to write it where they're at and then able to set reasonable goals for them. Um, so you can, I start a note for each student inside of a label. I call it uh, pre-assessment right now. And so there's 10 notes and inside of each note, you can write physical like typed notes, but you can also take pictures. And that's what I find is really handy when I am assessing students in the moment. Yeah. So say we're doing patterning in math with shapes. I'm not going to give them paper and glue and all that because now I'm including fine motor and all that, which is great. But in that moment, if I need to see if they can do it, they love playing with the manipulatives. So I'll give them some shapes. They create a pattern. Instead of writing down notes, you know, this student made a pattern with these shapes and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I take out Google Keep, which with my board, it is a safe thing to take photos for because we use G Suite Education. Um, I take a picture of it and it's got a really handy little tool. If anybody here is listening, Google people, yeah. I would love if I could kind of like Snapchat type on the picture. <laughs> anybody want to add that in? That'd be awesome. <laughs> but right now there's a little, yeah, seriously, I'm, I'm plugging that in right there. I would love that option. Mm. But right now I use the pen option. So I touch the pen option, I zoom in and I write two things, the date and how much support they received in that moment. So I have little code words. IND means they did it completely independently. Uh, w slash S with support. I could write LS for a little support uh, with prompt, W slash P with gestural prompt, all those kind of little codes that I have. Um, and then when I go to either write their IEPs or write their report cards, I can go back in and I can see, okay, this student on this day was able to make an AB pattern independently and here's the picture of it. And so my assessment is done in that moment and I'm not. I don't have papers. I don't have anything like that. And if I, you know, you don't forget anything at home because you have <laughs> access to it at home if you're writing report cards or outside on the patio at school if you're writing report cards. It's wherever you go. Um, and then the third part about it that I love is you can email the pictures to the parents, to the families, right from Google Keep. So I'm able to take a picture in that moment, but then I can send it to the parent and go, look at the proud work that your child has done. They did a great job today. And 
from experience of doing it in the past, families absolutely love it because they have a conversation starter with their child at home then. Mm -hmm. Hey, look at the picture that Miss Amber sent me of this proud work that you did. You know, tell me about what you did. I think I just rambled on for five minutes, but I I love Google Keep. (laughs) I want to know, because I've seen on Twitter and I'm a very, like, I, I enjoy when it's aesthetically pleasing. How do you get like the headers that, you know, look fancy? <laughs> That's Are what I care about right now. Ever? I care more about it looking good. I know it's going to help me. I get the organizational part of it, but like, does it look pretty? Uh, I, so I had no idea about these until um, it just popped up on Twitter yeah. like this past summer. You can find them on Teachers Pay Teachers for free. There's quite a decent number of them there. But because the note in Google Keep, when you're typing stuff, you can add photos to it. So if you just add the one photo, that's the only picture you see at the top. So in my teacher organization label of stuff for my to-do list and all that. I have a pretty one that says to do. I have a pretty one that says home, which is who I'm calling maybe or emailing or contacting. Um, None of the other ones. Oh, and then I have notes, which is my quick things like IEPs are due on this Mm -hmm. day or, you know, chat with this teacher really quick about this or ask that. Um, Things that are just, yeah, less important that don't need to be done right away. Mm-hmm. But um, it does it does make it look pretty aesthetically pleasing. There are also colors. You can make the notes all types of different colors. Um, so it, it does give you that nice balance. Okay. So one thing that I'm doing in season three of the podcast is playing like some games during my episodes. And one game that I haven't played yet and a game that literally just came to mind like a couple days ago is it's called What's in Your Google Drive? <laughs> We're talking about Google and I just found like, it's literally the best segue. I I couldn't even have even planned this any better. So all right, let's go. Get to know Amber better. (laughs) Um, I just want to know, I just have a question. So um, how many gigs are being used in your Google drive right now, Amber? How many, how many gigs? Yeah. Like if you go to your drive, at the bottom right. on the left hand corner, it well in oh mine boy. in French it says espouse de stockage. Uh, it says I have used twenty two point two gigs. Oh my lord, man! Now I don't to have be fair, platform. some of these <laughs> some of these folders, like for instance, I taught an ASD class two years ago, so I have access to a shared folder. So that one alone is probably quite large because it's teachers throwing resources in that we're allowed to share and use together. So I don't even know how, how big that folder is alone. Darn. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. What is your most recent open document? Ooh, uh, that's a good segue. <laughs> the nurtured heart approach, <laughs> which is the uh, the approach that myself and uh, my teammate are using this year in our classroom. So I went to training in the last week of August before school started and took a bunch of notes. And that's the most recent one. As if. Wait, mm-hmm. when did you do this training? And uh, So uh, I did the training the last week of August, the Monday. So it would have been my last week of uh, like holidays, air quotes around holidays, um, where I was kind of prepping, going back to school, uh, you know, doing classroom stuff. But uh, I discovered it because I read the book, uh, which is called The Difficult Child, uh, The Nurtured Heart Approach. And uh, somebody recommended to me last year, read it over the summer, tweeted about it. Guys, this is why Twitter is so important. Tweeted about it. And somebody Mm -hmm. responded and went, have you heard about the training? And I'm like, no, what? There's training? Tell me more. And two days later, I was signed up and ready to roll. And then one of my colleagues calls me, uh, texts me and goes, "Um, where did you hear about this? I can't find it online. And I'm like, oh, it's not through the school board, but it's through this instead. So she came with me. And then I got another phone call from another teacher. She couldn't make it, but she's looking (laughs) into it. So uh, the power of Twitter and... uh, tweeting about this learned, uh, got a lot of people learning about it. Okay. We're definitely going to dive into that, but first I'm wondering how is a document? Well, no, how is a document from August, your most recent open file on Google drive? Oh, cause I opened it recently. Uh, may, I, I may have opened it like right before this, <laughs> probably to read something. Now, if we're like, if we're looking at like, what was the most recent one open today? Uh, it's a behavior tracking document, okay. but, um, and my class info, because tomorrow I have, 
uh, a guest teacher in for me for the last like third of the day. So I was like, oh, I need to create like a, you know, here's all about my kids kind of thing. So yeah. had to do that too. So those are like the most recent ones if we want to do top three. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. I was just wondering there for a second, like, hmm. <laughs> seems suspicious. Next question. Well, definitely there. <laughs> do you have any, um, do you color code your Google Drive? Uh, <laughs> okay, kind of. It's only, so I, I did last year because it was easier to find the folders, like my current mm-hmm. folder for my school and stuff like that. But I have started to use the starred option instead. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding that handier than colors. Um, but there are a few folders that are still colored. Yes. Especially the like one that contains my resume and cover letter, just in case I need it one day, it is bright red. (laughs) Hopefully not though. Honestly, that's hopefully uh, not. I would hope not. Yeah. Not something I plan on, you know, whipping back out for the next little bit. Hopefully you either, but yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I just, just landed contract last year. So until then I did need it every year. Yeah. Ugh, it's hard. eh? But here we are to, I I don't want to say legitimate teachers, but two full time teachers, uh, <laughs> just teachers who know they have a job again in September. Hopefully, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very nicely put. Last question: When mm-hmm. you, because I am like the worst for this. This is this is a tell all about your Google Drive. Um, when you create your documents, do you put them like directly in your folder, or do you have to? jot down some time, like, you know, on a Wednesday afternoon to just like reorganize it and put everything in the right file folders? Like, do you do it when you create the document or do you have to do it afterwards? <laughs> it's funny because if uh, if my principal listened to this, he'd probably be laughing because he knows that I am the most organized person ever. No, even if I use the shortcut of doc.new, the organize option where you can click on the folder and then figure out where you need to put it. Oh, that's like the first thing I'm doing. Oh gosh. Okay. I need, I need you to send <laughs> me those vibes because I like I didn't orga- organize my drive until summer. Like I did a whole year of just my documents everywhere. It was horrible, horrible. I don't get it. People tell me they're like, all I do is that search drive option. I just type in the title that I'm looking for. And I literally, I'm, I'm just like, I can't, I can't even handle it. Yeah. It's, oh. There's folders. It's beautiful. Google Drive has so many like things you can do with it. Yeah. With it, like, do you have emojis and all that fun stuff too? Well, how do you do that? Uh, well, on, on my Mac, you can just do like control command space bar and then all my emojis pop up. I don't know if you're on a Mac. Oh. Are you on a Mac? No, I'm on a oh. Chromebook. My poor Mac is not doing so well. So, um, no, but no, <laughs> there's something new that I didn't know about it. Yeah. You could either, even like, this is a, a tougher way there. Just go on Google and write like, like heart emoji, and then it'll send you to, um, the website, oh my gosh, I used to use it all the time, is Emojipedia, and then you can copy it and then oh. put it in the title. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Ta- yeah. yeah. Oh. It's kind of dangerous. But I do – It's mine looks good, but when you just scroll down, like everything looks good at the beginning with all of my folders, emojis, colors, and then you scroll down, and then you see all the unfiled documents. <laughs> Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. No, no, I am. Yeah. <laughs> the type A personality, the organization skills. Yeah. It like, it just, it's, I, I can't handle it. It has to go into a folder somewhere. <laughs> so what, um, when I asked you on, on Twitter, you know, like Amber, what we're going to talk about, I, I'm really just going for season three, kind of gauging with, um, what my guests are passionate about, what their expertise is, and essentially just like what you're willing to share and chat. And one thing that you mentioned was a new approach that, that you've been trying this year. Um, and I kind of want to know all about it, especially because I also teach, um, I teach grade nine and 10 spec ed, and I often Mm -hmm. don't, speak on the podcast for some reason with elementary school educators. So I'm really excited to like hear your perspective um, about this approach in spec ed. And I'm going to try to like deduct all the things that I can use in my classroom tomorrow (laughs) from it. Yeah. And it's funny because when I went to this training, they're like, you guys can use this for any age. We can see we were all elementary educators uh, at the training, but um, 
yeah, so like I'd said, I read this book over the summer and I went to this training and it's something kind of similar that what we were kind of doing last year in our class. And we had a teacher come in to do some observations and she's like, you're kind of half doing it already. You guys should really learn more about it. So, and fully uh, disclaimer, I am brand new to this. If anybody is listening to it and they do Nurtured Heart, please, if you hear anything and you're like, oh, you should try this and message me because I would love to learn more. But um, I, we are trying the Nurtured Heart approach. And uh, basically what they talk about is a kid's portfolio, the words that they believe describe them. And so they actually started off the training with, you know, like a, an imaginary kid in the morning. So they're, you know, they're waking up and oh, they're trying to get up and all they hear is, oh my goodness, can you get up, please? Like, hurry up, get downstairs, eat your breakfast, you know, hurry up. Like, oh, could you take any longer to put those shoes on? My goodness. Then they get to school. Oh, you're late. Hurry up, get in the class. Like all those kinds of things. And they kind of said like, what if we switch it, we flip it and replay that again. Okay. The kid is waking up, you know, he's moving his body and all he hears is, Oh, I see that you're moving your body around. You're starting to wake your body up. Thank you so much. I I appreciate that. You're, you know, starting to get yourself moving for the day. I'll see you downstairs for breakfast. Mm. Totally different approach in that they're receiving positive energy and they're giving energy to that positive and just creating those portfolio and those words that are building up the child instead. Um, and so it's all about giving energy into the, the good things, the positive things, and when the things go right, and not giving negative to the uh, not giving energy to the negative. Um, so, in terms of like, instead of you have two kids playing, instead of going, "Are you guys playing nicely?" You catch them when they are playing nicely. Oh, I see that you guys. I see that you're sharing the blocks and you're taking turns. You guys are such great friends. Mm-hmm. You're building up, you're building rules and you're building what you want them to do yeah. by showing them, hey, great job. Because most of the time, oh, they're playing nicely. Okay, I'm going to go deal with this situation where it's not going so nicely. But then that situation that is going nicely, do they really understand that this is the way it's supposed to be? Because they're not receiving any attention. They're just playing by themselves on the side or doing their work or whatever it is. Or if they're at recess and they're doing a great job, but they're not receiving any energy while it is a good job. But then when they're doing something negative, they're receiving energy because we're constantly going, get inside, get inside, put the ball away, put, put the ball away, please. Yeah. Right. Um, so, but very challenging too, because there are certain things that, you know, they, they tell you not to do. So we don't count down. We don't do three, two, one. We don't give warnings in terms of now being in special education. There's difference between transition warnings and actual warnings. So we do give transition warnings in five minutes, we will clean up all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other thing is being clear and this one, I still catch myself. And I mean, we're only three weeks in, so I'm going to catch myself probably multiple times, but if you're giving an instruction, um, I don't know about you, but I find myself asking a question constantly. Can you go get your pencil, please? Can you go do that? But instead changing it to, I need you to go get your pencil, please. Because all of a sudden I'm not creating some sort of like, I don't know, do do I need to get my pencil? Do I need to get that? No, my teacher told me I need to get my pencil. I'm going to go get my pencil. There, That is something that I'm using in class tomorrow. I am probably the queen of the questioning. Right? Yes. And I catch, and the teammate that I work with, she just kind of, I'll hear a little chuckle out of her because I'll be like, can you go get your pencil? I need you to go get your pencil, please. And she'll, she'll, yeah, but we're catching each other on that. And that's a big one. And it was just saying like, if you need your student to be following the rules, you need to be clear about them. And it also helps for myself because as a special education teacher, I have to be very clear in what words I use, because if I'm using too many, if I'm creating a sentence that has words that they don't even understand yet, it does them no good. And it does me no good because now I'm giving them a instruction and they're like, you want me to do what again? Right. So I need you to, and breaking it down. So instead of, I need you to come and eat your lunch. Okay. They're not listening. I need you to come and sit on the chair or even smaller. I need you to just come stand here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't, you're coming right away. You're, I see you walking towards me. You're a good listener. Now I need you to sit down. Oh, you sat, look at that. You sat down. And now I need you to take out your sandwich out of your lunch. Simple, clear instructions while also giving energy to the positive as they follow them. Yeah, I think 
honestly, it sounds really silly, but it could very easily be be applied in high school. And I think Mm -hmm. that because they are quote unquote older, we assume that, you know, I think sometimes when I give instructions, I, that is definitely like the biggest one that I need to work on right in my head. I'm already thinking about like the end of this whole act. Yeah. Right. So I'm like Mm -hmm. flowing through all this. I'm thinking about, okay, I need somebody to do this. Okay. So when I'm giving instructions, I think it's rolling off of my tongue as quickly as it's rolling through my head. Mm -hmm. And I might put two together like, okay, you need to grab your Chromebook and then I need you to go into Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. And even just that, right? Just get up and grab a Chrome and come and sit back down, you know, almost as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Don't get sidetracked in between kind of thing. Yeah, (laughs) Get up and walk straight to the Chromebook (laughs) and grab one and come straight back. Yeah. And then giving energy as well to that, right? So the moment they get up, if it's a struggle to just follow that instruction, um, giving energy to it, or if they're sitting around and waiting, the moment that they do follow the instruction, you give energy to it. And it's showing them like, ah, oh, like I'm following the instruction and I get her attention. I get to hear positive words um, in the sense of like, not like I get to, but like there's energy in what's expected. Yeah. So one word that you're using often is energy. And I'm just wondering what that term like signifies. Why is that? Is that like a word that they use often in this approach? And yeah. why do you think they use that? that uh that energy word because i i don't know it's not really something it's not like a a term that we hear often in education do you find uh probably not a term that i've heard as much until this but then when i learned about this approach it made so much sense to me um say for example i've got a student who is throwing a temper tantrum in class and if i'm constantly going over to them and talking to them or, or something's happened at recess and then I sit down and lecture them for five minutes. They suddenly realize that if they do that, they get five minutes of my attention. They get five minutes of my energy giving it to them. It, it might not be energy that's positive, but they're receiving some sort of energy. Whereas when they do something that's good, they're not getting me at all because I'm not going over to them and saying, hey, good job. Like you're doing such a, like, I see you playing. I see you just shared the ball with your friend. So we want to flip it and we want them to see that when I am making good choices um, and, you know, we are giving them positive things and building their portfolio using words like uh, we actually have picked a couple specific wording that we want to just work on so that we don't feel super overwhelmed. So things like good listener, um, a a nice friend, um, there's a couple others, but the word energy just kind of encompasses like when I am not following instructions, I'm not going to get their attention. They're not going to ignore me. I'm not ignoring them. I'm not walking out of the room, but I'm not giving energy to it. Cause the, the ignoring word was something that they kind of talked about. It's not that you're going to just walk around and be like, okay, bye. Like you're not listening. It's just, you're not, you might be there. They know you're there, Mm -hmm. but you're not giving energy to them right now until they're ready to follow the instruction or to do what's expected or to show that positive portfolio, and then you give the energy to it. So there's a difference. I don't know if you, I'm explaining it right, but the difference between like ignoring and just not giving energy to it. Of course. Do you find, and I know it's like almost not fair to ask you this because it's it's only been three weeks, but you find that the students are responding better to this type of approach and how? That's a good question. Um, Now, last year to this year, I have eight brand new students um, oh, okay. brand new to special education as well. They've all come from what we call mainstream into a, a congregated class. So I only have two students where I'm trying this in terms of last year's approach, which was similar, but we didn't really have a theory behind it to this year. Um, but I do feel that the energy, the vibe in the room in general yeah. is just more positive because I'm when there is something going on, I'm not talking about it. I'm not uh, prompting it or anything like that, but I'm building up and using those positive words. You know, that positive voice that we have sometimes. Oh, good job. You know, that high pitch thing. Um, But I I do use it because I do have students that have very little speech or very little understanding of English and that high pitch, the clapping, things like that. They understand that as positive to their portfolio. 
But yeah, I feel the vibe just in the room is more positive. Um, and I've seen little moments where I don't know if I could say it's definitely NHA. It's definitely nurtured heart approach. That's made a difference in that moment, but it's definitely helping me myself as an educator. But there are moments too, where I'm like, I can hear to my head, NHA, 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 don't Aww. just don't give energy right now. Um, or looking, going back to my notes and going, okay, what should I have done in that moment instead? So interesting. Okay. I just like, I, I'm trying to put everything that you're saying in, into my context. And one question that I'm wondering is, um, like for those students who are used to getting attention from the bad, right? Mm-hmm. Let's just say, mm-hmm. um, how are they responding? I just feel like, and again, not that you're ignoring them, but if that's the only way that they know how to get attention, mm-hmm. you have to like almost unlearn. Yep. Like you're you're giving yourself, I don't want to say like you're giving yourself so much work by doing this approach, but like you need to overcome like a lot of obstacles with with some of maybe like your students, um, just because you're unlearning all of those things for them and, and relearning a new way for that that positive energy and that positive, almost like validation that you can give them when they're doing good things. Yeah. But it's funny how you say it's almost like a lot of work you're giving yourself because that came up in our training, but the trainer just kind of went, yeah, but if you're doing your old way, it takes a lot of energy just to be like, I need you to come here. I need you to come here. Stop doing that. I need you to come here. Or, you know, you're, you're, you just blah, blah, blah. All the energy that you're giving to that negative is the same amount of energy that's going to take. You just have to figure out a different way to do it. Um, but yeah, it's right. Yeah. Yeah, If you think about it that way, and I didn't think about it that way until, um, I heard her say that where it was like, well, yeah, it's a lot of work to change your thinking, but it's a lot of work to also give energy to the negative because you're just constantly doing it over and over and over again. Yeah. I might have a student who throws a temper tantrum for 30 minutes in my class until I see that positive. And then the moment I see the positive, I'm like, you have a quiet, I I can hear that you have a quiet voice. I would like you to come to circle, please. Might not happen right away, but we're, mm-hmm. we're working on it. Yeah. Okay. When you were talking about how you got to know this approach, is this an approach that came from the book about the difficult child or where, like, where does this come from? The book is called The Difficult Child, The Nurtured Heart Approach. So okay. it's all about, oh, um, because gotcha. what they talk about is you can have children because it's actually a parenting technique as well. And then also applied to educators. Um, And they say like, there are children where because they don't have that extra energy or I'm not using, you know, the word normal or anything like that, but um, they may just respond to discipline and regular rules and all that kind of stuff, just in a a way that just it's, it's instant. You ask them to do something, they do it. Okay. But you might have kids like what they call in the training, the difficult child who have more energy and we need to figure out how to give positive energy to when they're making good choices and not give energy to when there aren't the choices that we want to see. Um, so they do talk about that as well. Okay. Really cool. I want to transition quickly, yeah, yeah. um, before we come to the end of the podcast, because it, it actually kind of ties in really nicely with this. Um, first of all, deciding to do professional development and reading, you know, education books and going to um, professional development sessions, like during our quote unquote holidays Mm -hmm. or summer or whatever it may be, um, is definitely something that we have in common. And I think with our, the podcast and Twitter and being, you know, involved with voice ed radio and going to, um, our ed camp in Ottawa, like we are definitely educators who hold a very special place in our heart for, you know, our own development, Mm -hmm. but ultimately like for the students that we get to interact with every day. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you do really well and that I wanted to kind of shine a light on in this podcast is your blog and the way that you, um, reflect it's so short and sweet and like powerful and fun all at the same time. Like mm. when I was looking through it, those were just like all the words that came to mind. And it's something that I like through my blog, I was not able to reflect maybe as like efficiently as you and efficiently as you. And so I just want to kind of like get into your mind and see, first of all, in your blog, like how do you come up with 
blog post topics? Do you brainstorm them? Do you like write notes in your Google Keeps? How do you, what is your process like for that? Um, yeah, I, uh, I have a goal this year. My phone has reminders to remind me to actually write stuff down. Um, the goal is twice a month, every two weeks to release a post. And even it's just that short, sweet thing. But um, typically it's, no, I don't, I don't take notes beforehand. It's all up in my head. And then I just sit down one night and I just word vomit it all out kind of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's typically whatever is going on in my head in that moment of that week. So I kind of think back what's been going on in my head a lot. Um, and the most recent one has been something that has been on my mind. I I think I titled it like slow and steady. And I actually had a teacher yesterday or the day before who teaches a similar class to mine, come into my classroom and, um, observe and just learn because it's her first year teaching, uh, this type of class. And she actually asked me, she said, a year ago today, like this time last year, what would you have told yourself now that you've, you're at this stage? And I said, funny enough, exactly what I just blogged about, go slow and steady. Mm-hmm. And it was the theme of this year when I started out because last year I was the new teacher and the majority of my kids were already in this program for at least one year. Whereas this year I'm returning to the program and I have eight brand new kids. And so the thing that kept going through my mind was you can't rush things because none, eight out of 10 of them don't know the routines that are going to be set for them. Eight out of 10 of them, you know, may have just seen the classroom once or twice as like a school tour. Eight out of 10 of them don't know what your expectations are going to be. They don't know what their daily routine is going to be. They don't know when they're going to eat yet because they haven't seen the schedule yet because they haven't been to school. So that kept going through my mind. And so when I sat down to blog the most recent one, I was like, I'm going to write about being slow and steady because me last year or any other teacher who wants to read it needs to see that slow and steady is okay. It's, it's okay to start off and make sure that your kids know your routines well. Yes, you're starting academics and yes, you're starting assessments. But if you hit the ground running sometimes too fast, you maybe burn out or maybe you feel too overwhelmed. Me, myself, I'm somebody where most of the pressure comes from myself anyway, but yeah. it typically is something oh, that's I going on it. in my head. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know, because my goal this year is every two weeks. So maybe it will have to be something where I'm writing something down to think about. I've also thought about if I, if there isn't something kind of brewing in my head, uh, blogging, doing like a, this is what today looked like kind of thing. Um, being kind of honest of, yeah, you know what today I actually had to sit down and eat lunch or I didn't get to sit down and eat lunch, or I had to call a parent after school, or I walked out of school and went, man, I feel like the worst teacher ever, or today was a great day. Um, but the goal is to be as honest as possible because I, yeah, because I, I appreciate when other educators are reflective and honest about their day because it makes me almost feel better as an educator because I'm like, okay, I'm not alone. If I feel like, like if they're feeling like that sometimes, I know I felt like that sometimes other educators are feeling like this. It's not just me. And it brings that community aspect in and that support. So that's the, that's the goal behind it is for me to learn and reflect. But also if there's just one educator out there who reads my blog and goes, oh my goodness, I feel like that too sometimes, then I, I think I've accomplished what I would like to do. Totally amazing. Can you just shamelessly share your blog right now since it's the perfect moment? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is Amber Gross, A-M-B-E-R-G-R-O-H-S dot blogspot.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter and the link is right in my bio. One of my favorite blog posts, hands down from you, is your blog post about how to pronounce your last name. It's literally the best. (laughs) And I'm not even going to lie. Like I went to read it before this podcast to make sure that I was going to say it correctly. I probably... That's how you knew. Because when you said it in the beginning, I was like, whoo, that rolled off her tongue quite nicely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I need to do my homework for for this kind of... For these kinds of things. So I had read it before... And I had read it like a few times every time like I go to your blog, just because I think it's so funny and so amazing. And just like, I don't know, it (laughs) it really makes me laugh. I got to use it this weekend because I said somebody's full name and they looked back at me and went, Amber, I still don't know how to say your last name. And it's on social media, like for personal, it's, it's there. And so I went, oh, you say it gross. 
like you, that's disgusting. And he just laughed. And I'm like, but see, now you're not embarrassed to say it again like that because you know it's said like that. And you think it's funny. So you know what? It works. It's just, it's very ingenious the way you wrote it. And I don't know. It's it's so (laughs) cool. So hands down, unless you write another blog post about your last name, that'll always be my favorite that you have posted. (laughs) And that's okay. It's okay. Um, I want to finish the podcast with one last quick game. It is called Alliteration Station. And what I have here is three sets, okay, of alliteration. So words that start with the same sound. And all I need for you is to pick which one you want to um, kind of like explain, okay? All you need to do, so there, there are three words, and then you will explain however you interpret that word. It's very simple. So I'll give you the... So like I'm basically like a human dictionary. Yeah. Well, like it can be with your own like personal experiences. It could be an anecdote. It could be like a quote. It could be anything. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And you only have like like a minute or like 30 seconds to explain each one. Like you don't need to go into, you know, deep depth and details. Right. That could, that could be one. Deep depth, <laughs> deep, oh my goodness. Okay. I should write oh, man. clear instructions off for my games because I just wing the definition every time. And sometimes I change the game like spot on, like when I'm on the podcast. So hey, it all, it's fresh. It's new. Yeah. We go with the flow. Go with the flow. No, uh, no, no, big rules for any of this. So, and we can break the rules anyways. If you want to break the rules, Amber, you can. All right. Sounds good. So here are your options. Okay. So I'm going to give you the three sets of alliterations and you pick whatever one you want. So the first one is M All right. and your words are motivation, mantra, and mission. So that's option one. Your second option is S. So students, song, and success. Okay. And your third option is I. So innovate, inspire, and imagine. Oh, man. So you can interpret these words any way you want and just kind of like give me whatever you got for like one of the sets. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I mean... <laughs> It's funny because the the first thing that came to mind was the S one, the student's song and success, yeah. um, mainly because teaching the, I mean, older students obviously love music too, but um, I have a particular student that music is actually like as a strength, like music and rhythmic abilities. And so we do the um, Jolly Phonics program um, in my class. And so I sing along with my students to the songs multiple times. And it's really neat to see within the first three weeks where I played the song and they're literally sitting there going like, "Mm, okay. And here we are three weeks in and they are singing and doing the actions and they're remembering the sounds that the letter makes or whether we're singing the days of the week song or the months of the year song. I like using music to uh, incorporate learning of different areas. And so, um, I think that's where student song and success comes from. My students, I use songs with my students in order to build success in their learning. Amber, that's incredible. Usually I ask my guests like, or the way, I guess the way that I would have interpreted that was like each each word like would have a story, but you just blended them all together. Oh, I just, <laughs> and that it just made but like a story. Literally, that's what came to mind though. Yeah was me sitting this morning and we're going, um, the snake is in the grass. The snake is it. Yeah. That's what we were doing this morning. So that's what just came to mind and was us singing our, singing our songs together. Oh, and on that note, um, I think it's just the perfect way to end the podcast with your singing right there. So <laughs> I want that to be the last thing that people remember when they listen to this podcast on, well, other than your Twitter. I don't think you mentioned your Twitter handle. How can people go follow you on Twitter? Yeah. Um, at Amber, A-M-B-E-R underscore gross, G-R-O-H-S, if I'm not mistaken. That would be really bad if I said the wrong Twitter handle, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Cool. That's correct. So I'll put Twitter handle, your blog spot website, and all of the resources to the Nurtured Heart Approach um, in the show notes of this episode. And Amber, oh, I just want to say like thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today because you know, as 
educators, as spec ed teachers, uh, we know definitely that our time and our energy are our most valuable resources. So I just want to um, remind all of my listeners that in this big, beautiful world of education, we give what we can, we do what we can, and for the rest, que sera, sera. Que sera, sera is a proud member of the Voice Ed Radio Network. Original music, editing, and production of this podcast is done by the talented Mathieu Leroux. Find my podcast on all podcast platforms, including SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and now newly on YouTube. Talk to you soon.